say many thanks. In 2010, Steve Jobs emphatically declared that we'd exited the PC era and we're moving firmly into the mobile era. Now, people who primarily interact with all of our technology and information with services through their mobile devices. I know I do. But the question is, what comes next? What comes after that? What will the post-mobile era look like? And what will the implications be for networking, infrastructure, and the data center? In this future-focused talk uh, discussing the post-mobile era and what we need to be ready for it, please join me in welcoming the CEO of Possibility and Purpose, Mr. Steve Brown. So back in the summer of 2010, an ailing Steve Jobs declared it was now the post-PC era. Now, what Steve meant by that was not that suddenly we were not going to be using PCs anymore. I just came from backstage where it is a flurry of technological activity. There are PCs everywhere. I wager that the backpacks you have with you today, you probably have some PCs out there somewhere in the audience. He didn't mean that PCs were going to go away. What he meant was that the primary method that we would, as human beings, interact with digital information and technology would be through mobile devices. Because these things that we carry with us everywhere, the extensions to our bodies almost, these have become the remote controls for modern life. So the question I wanted to ask today is, what does it look like in the post-mobile era? I'm not suggesting there that this is an era where we won't have smartphones anymore. But it is an era where the primary way that we interface with digital services and digital information will be through means other than mobile. My name is Steve Brown. Uh, I'm a futurist. I, for a long time, was a futurist at Intel. I'm now an independent uh, consultant and speaker on the future of all things and all disciplines. Um, you might ask, well, hang on, what is a futurist? Um, you heard this morning that you cannot predict the future. You heard that from Jason. And he's right, a good futurist does not attempt to predict the future. A futurist looks at trends in business, looks at trends in technology, the big disruptive force of our time, uh, looks at trends in ecosystem trends, looks at the most important set of trends, which is how do people use technology? How do people incorporate technology into their lives? If you follow the intersections of those trends, you can start to divine what is going to be possible in a certain time frame, five years from now, 10 years from now. As some of my clients I even go out 15 or 20 years from now. So as a futurist, which many might think is oh, that's kind of a bullshit title. No, it's, it's a great, it is a recognized title. Um, what it means is it's not predicting the future. It is saying what is going to be possible in a given time frame, and then trying to decide, well, OK, what are we going to build in that time frame, and how do we start on that today? So that's, that's what I do for a living. Now, we're going to talk about where technology is going to help you start thinking about well, what do you need to do differently to plan for what's coming. But before we do that, I think it's useful to just have a little look back at how far we have come to date. I moved from, you probably tell from my outrageous British accent that I'm not from around these here parts. I came to America uh, about 20 years ago. And when I came to the States in 1997, well, just look at all these logos here. Just take a moment to look at all of those different products, services, pieces of technology and think about how important they are to your day-to-day -day life, to the day-to-day -day life of your friends, your kids, your parents. These are the companies, the services that sort of define modern existence, at least in a, in a westernized modern setting today. And yet, when I moved to the United States in 1997, none of those companies, none of those brands, none of those products or services existed. So in 20 years, all that has happened. If you break it down a little more, 15 years ago, no Facebook. 10 years ago, no iPhone. Five years ago, no Amazon Echo. It's happened really quite rapidly. So when I talk about what is coming next, you have to think about it and sort of accept it within that context of just how far we have come in those 20 years. The other thing that's worth noting is, I'm highlighting here in blue all of the services, all of the products and technologies that fundamentally 
could not exist, would not be possible without data centers. So a lot of the sort of fabric of modern life and the way we use and interact with technology is fully reliant on all the stuff that you do. Now, how has all this happened? Two eye chart, um, log logarithmic charts to look at. It's all about exponential change. We've heard this over and over. What it means is more capability every year and costs coming down every year. Now, that has led us to go through a few different eras of technology as technology has become more accessible, has shrunk down, and more powerful over time. So we enjoyed the PC era for a number of years. Now we're firmly in the mobile era. The question is always, well, what's next? What is the thing? What is the thing that comes after mobile? What I'm here to tell you today, there's no thing. There isn't a thing. It's lots of things. Lots and lots of things. And we're going to get into that in a second. So a way to think about this is, when we started out with the sort of first era of personal computing, we interacted with PCs typically, uh, with prog we ran programs on them, we tapped away at our keyboards, and those programs came on fixed media of some sort, even cassette tapes back in my early days when I still had luxurious amounts of flowing hair. In the second era of personal computing, we got connected. Get connected to the web, we started to embrace GUIs and browsers, and off we went. And we were talking to web servers somewhere out there in the ether. The third era, the era that we're now in, was all about, or is all about, mobile devices. It's other devices too, but it's primarily the primary way that we interact with digital information and services is through mobile. And we're talking to a cloud infrastructure that is flexible and powerful. So what's next? What's coming next is lots and lots and lots of things. The, there are lots of different terms for it. Everybody talks about the Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. It's a sort of overused, tired term now. But lots and lots of smart, connected things connected to an evolving cloud infrastructure. A cloud infrastructure that now supports AI and machine learning, that has advanced analytics, and that people interact with in new ways. We're going to move from more of an apps-based model to more of a services-based model and move from the touch model that we use today, where you know, Steve Jobs always told us it's all about your finger, to more of a voice and gesture-based model. So let's look at what the platform is going to look like in a bit more detail. We're going to see a lot more endpoints, a lot more. Wearables are still at early days. You're going to see those develop quite dramatically over the next five to 10 years. And you're going to start to see technology, as the cost of technology continues to plummet, the physical size of decent amounts of computing power continue to drop. You're going to see lots and lots of smart connected objects and smart connected spaces. And when that happens, you're going to have all of these spaces, all of these objects wanting to connect to something. There is going to be a huge new load on the data center, and there are going to be new challenges, new, new demands on the data center with regards to the kind of compute that those devices are looking for it to execute. You're also going to see a lot in the way of autonomous machines. I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. But lots and lots of endpoints. They're going to be talking to an evolving cloud with an evolving set of services and capabilities in there. Still going to need a lot of traditional computing services, compute, storage, networking, all of those things. But in addition to that, you're going to see a lot more in the way of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning capabilities. And you just heard from Vijay about Facebook's 10-year roadmap. I think what you, the way we experience, the way we think about social media just 10 years from now is going to be dramatically different than the experience that we have today. Certainly, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, that's what's going to happen. So if you think about where Facebook was 10 years ago versus where we are now, and then fast forward 10 years, it's going to be even more of a change, I suspect, in terms of the way we think about social media and the capabilities that we look to it to provide to us. Conversation as a service, the ability to talk to computing services, to have them understand what we're saying and act on what we ask for, either uh, through a chatbot or through a much more sophisticated personal digital assistant or virtual digital assistant, is also a very likely set of cloud services that are going to need to be provided in the future. So you can see the cloud evolving dramatically, 
the ability to natively handle blockchain transitions. Blockchain is really only just starting to get going. You can see that the cloud and the capabilities of a data center are going to expand with time. And the way that we interface between those endpoints and those cloud services is also going to evolve. Yes, we'll probably still use touch a little bit. There'll be some more gesture. I think the real, uh, really interesting interfaces are going to be voice. And you're already seeing the beginnings of that today. It's still got some way to go, but we're getting there quite rapidly. And then as virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality start to gain traction, uh, that, that right now the technology is still challenged and the cost point is still too high, those will get resolved in the next three to five years. When that happens, you're going to see that become the primary interface for people to interact with digital information, digital services. So we can expect a new and expanding set of workloads that are going to be running on the data centers that you help to design and build. You're going to start to see virtual reality not become something that you run from a PC, but that is going to be streaming from the cloud. You just heard from Vijay that object recognition is something that Facebook is working on for their particular reasons. There are many reasons that you want to help computers be able to see and understand the world. Object recognition capability is going to be running in the cloud in support of these smart um, endpoints. Autonomous machines, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, robotics, uh, virtual personal assistants, sort of the evolution of Siri on, and Cortana and uh, Alexa. You see all of these different services, and they all have a workload which is huge on the data center, and that in many cases requires a type of computing to support it that is very different than traditional sort of von Neumann number crunching computing, or at least can be accelerated by lots of non-von Neumann. It's hard to say, non-von Neumann architectures. So new and expanding workloads are going to change the demands on the data center. Let's dive into a few of those and just talk about how those are going to evolve over time. So virtual reality, augmented reality. How many of you have tried virtual reality and augmented reality? Just by a show of hands here. So you've, some of you had a dabble. OK. So they are currently in their infancy. They're pretty cool. But I think of it as being like the EGA graphics of the computer systems that we had in the what, late 1980s, um, early 1990s. EGA graphics is to today's VR as HD graphics is to the VR that's coming. What do I, and how is it going to change? Well, first of all, it's going to have a lot more fidelity, a lot more resolution, a lot more detail. But you're also going to see virtual reality become more volumetric, so the ability to explore volumetric video. And for those of you who don't know what volumetric video is, it is a way of capturing um, a 3D scene in video, but capturing it in such detail and with a sort of capture hardware that allows you to not just look around and move your head like this, but to crouch down and look underneath an object or look over the top. So this is not rendered. Um, this is captured from reality and allows you to, get, to move around it sort of in six degrees of freedom. So think of it as 3D volumetric video, or 60 volumetric video, if you want to add your dimensions together. Volumetric video starts at three gigabytes per frame. Just think about the demand that is going to place when you're trying to stream that from a data center. So virtual reality is going to go way beyond gaming. You're going to see it um, move into lots of other fields. And as it sort of stretches into augmented reality, and, uh, and mixed reality in particular, or merged reality, depending on what language you, you choose to use, different companies using different language, you're going to see it become a primary way of interacting with digital information and services, and it's going to put quite a lot of demand on the data center. And it's also going to link through to that object recognition capability for augmented and mixed reality to work well. So that's going to have to be a cloud function that people can call upon. We're moving towards a voice-first world. You're seeing a lot of voice-enabled devices out there already, and that is only going to increase over time. So this is a very clear trend. Those voice-enabled devices are going to be talking to products and services, but they're going to need to talk to them through something. 
And so you're seeing the emergence of virtual personal assistants, messaging platforms that can handle voice, and chatbots that sit on top of those. So in a voice-first world, what we're looking at is moving from a situation where the GUI, the graphics user interface, is running on the client to a world where the voice user interface, the vocal user interface, the VUI, is running in the cloud. So from GUI on the client to VUI in the cloud. Gartner's view on this is that by 2019, 20% of smartphone user interactions will take place via these virtual personal assistants as they get better and better. And that by 2020, the majority of devices that are released are going to be designed to function with minimal or zero touch. So moving away from touch and towards voice. And if you look at just the number of skills that one service, Amazon's Alexa has, it's got over 10,000 skills. When, it means, when you talk about skills, it is services or products that it is connecting to on the back end. So again, these, these have a long way to go. I'm not saying that we're there yet. But it's very clear that a voice-first world is what we're moving into. And of course, speech recognition, language recognition, natural, natural language processing is going to be happening in the cloud. So voice is coming. Also, the robots are coming. Run for your lives, my god. <laughs> so uh, robots have been something that have been kind of part of science fiction for a long, long time. They were either in science fiction novels or they were things that built our cars for us. Now, the reason for that, the reason they were trapped in the pages of science fiction novels or trapped inside car manufacturing facilities is robots could not really see and understand the world around them. That meant that they were not safe to be in a similar environment with human beings. That is changing. So with artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine vision, making leaps and bounds forward, and the cost of these things dramatically dropping, you're seeing robots, autonomous machines, show up everywhere. I talked to lots of clients who are thinking about, well, how could I use a robot to do this or that? Suddenly, it is not something that is, oh, well, yeah, robots one day. It is, how can we do robots next week? So you're seeing it in transportation. I mean, a lot of discussion on autonomous vehicles. In agriculture, what you're seeing here is a little robot called Harvey. Harvey is used in nurseries to thin out plants. And it, you just set them off, and they just do it. They, they work like little, a little team. And they're replacing work that was you know, back-breaking work formerly done by migrant workers. In construction, it's the SAM 100 machine. It's a bricklayer. In retail, that's from Bossa Nova Robotics. Uh, just up the road here in San Francisco. That is doing um, kind of checking, see what's on the shelves, doing a stock count in a grocery store. The bottom left there, you see Starship Technologies has created a delivery pod. And these things, they go in a, a delivery van, they go to a central point in a town, and then they scatter out, and they will navigate their way over the, the sidewalk and go to people's homes and deliver goods. And then they come back to their van, and they get off to the next place, and off, they get loaded again, and off they go. Very interesting-looking technology that is aimed at delivering, you know, doing last-mile delivery so that you can do one-hour, one-dollar delivery of items. Completely disruptive. In hospitality, Savioki's got this robot that will help bring things to your room if you need a towel or a toothbrush come up to your room and deliver it for you. Manufacturing, Baxter here is a $22,000 robot you can program without knowing how to program robots. You just show him what to do. And in the home, we'll see if this happens. Uh, if you haven't seen this, it's really cool. It's called Moly, M-O-L-E-Y. I'd love it to happen. It's a robot that will, you can motion capture a chef cooking a meal, and then it will cook that meal for you in your home. It's a, it's a robot and oven and dishwasher and sink all together in one unit. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. It's pretty interesting. So the robots are coming. But most importantly, from your perspective, what you need to know is those robots are going to be talking. They're going to be talking to each other. Because those robots are going to be learning devices. As they learn new skills, as they encounter the world, they will be sensing the world, figuring out what they can learn. And once they learn a lesson, they want to tell all their buddies. They want to tell all their brothers and sisters who are just like them all around the world, if you encounter this, this is what you should do. It worked for me. So they're going to be talking to each other. They're going to be gathering information about the world. And that's got to go somewhere. 
So these are going to have a big load on the data center as well. I'll give you an example of a robot that happens to have four seats inside it and a steering wheel. But the Tesla cars are bristling with sensors. This is what's enabling them to be switched on to have an autonomous driving mode. Eight cameras in the latest ones. A radar, 12 ultrasonic sensors, location, temperature, battery. All this information is being gathered and sent to a Tesla data center for analysis. So that these cars, which have now done 1.3 billion miles, driven by humans, gathering 1.3 billion miles worth of driving data to help autonomous computing solutions to be able to drive these for us in future. Massive amounts of data is going to be spurting out of all of these autonomous machines so that we can learn from them and help to make them better. It's not just robots. Um, there are lots of other things that are going to be happening within every industry sector. I would contend that every company is soon going to become a data company. That every different industry sector, some have already embraced you know, computerization and the collection of data on some level already. Many have resisted it. But every, data, every company is going to become a data company because if they don't, they will not be competitive. Now, what do I mean by becoming a data company? They're going to be gathering data on their operations, gathering information about their customers, gathering information about the way they serve those customers, about their products, how those products work in the real world, getting sort of warranty information. They're going to be gathering tons of data. And they're going to be doing it for really four big reasons. The first one is, they're going to benefit from process automation. If you can gather information about, if you can sense what's happening within your business, you can start to think about, how do I help build computing processes, whether it's using a robot or algorithms or whatever, to sit alongside the humans in my business and help them be more effective? So an, an example would be, uh, I'll give you an example from retail. We all shop, so that's, it's always a good accessible example. If you go to a re uh, retail store and you're trying on clothes, you've probably had that experience where you have three or four garments, and then you, go in, you want to go in the change room and try them on, and there's a helpful store associate there. And they say, well, let me take those for you. And then they hang them up and arrange them in the change room and say, if you need anything, my name's Chelsea or whatever it, whatever it is. Right? And then they, they come back a few minutes later, and what they've done, they weren't being helpful. They were helping you sort of by arranging your clothes. But what they're really doing is looking at all of your clothing items and getting a sense of what is your size, what colors have you chosen, and what's your rough style. And then their job is to run back into the store and pick out items that they think they can sell you up on. So if you have you know, a pair of jeans, or, oh, this shirt would go very nicely with those pair of jeans, sir. Why don't you try it? And if they can sell you up you know, one, in, one time in 10, that's a big boost for the retail store. Now, you could automate that process. You could help support that, that store associate by using RFID tags, understanding exactly what clothes you took in the store, looking them up in a database, running some analytics, and making recommendations to the store associate on items that you know are in stock, and help, uh, under, help that store associate know exactly where they are in the store. So they can go find those things, bring them back, and hopefully that should increase your chance to be able to sell up. So it's a simple example, but dividing the task, understanding what could be done by a human and what could be done by an algorithm or a robot, and coming up with a smart labor strategy is going to be something that many, many companies do. And process automation, whether it is to replace humans in a particular role and free them up to do something else that's more customer facing, or to augment them and help them get more done in their day, is going to be a big, big deal in the next five to 10 years. They also want to be able to offer personalization, customization. If you're a millennial, uh, you are really interested in this. You want, why would you have the same as everybody else? You can personalize, you can customize your, your Starbucks coffee. Why can't you customize your suit or your shoes or any other item that you might buy? To do that, you have to understand your customer's preferences and your customer's habits. So you can see a lot of, cust a lot of uh, industries gathering more information and analyzing more information on their customers. It also gives an opportunity to innovate in business models, to think about not just selling um, products, but now selling services, experiences, and transformations. 
you can make more money as you go up that, that chain from pro selling a product to selling a transformation. I work with a doggy daycare company, really nice little company I talked with last year. They sell a service of looking after your dog. If they could measure what that dog's behavior is during the day, how much that dog, that particular dog eats, how much it socializes, and then intervene to improve a dog's socialization, to help it put on a diet if it's a fat dog. You can deliver a transformation that a customer is going to pay for, because who doesn't like their pooch? So being able to think about delivering transformations is a, a big difference. And then maybe some companies are going to even be gathering data and realizing there is money to be made in that data and selling it on to other agencies, so pivoting to a database business. There's also what I call the 5G kicker. Um, you're going to see a lot more dumb endpoints. And I have a cute little guy I want to show you here. This is Dino. He's a little dinosaur designed to tell stories and teach and interact with young children. And fundamentally, he is a very simple device. He's a piece of plastic, very nice, beautifully designed piece of plastic. It's very soft to the touch. He has a button, a light in his mouth, a microphone, and a speaker. And then you know, he connects to Wi-Fi. That's all that's in this thing. I don't know what the bill of materials is, but it's not the $120 that they charge you to buy one of these. This is brilliant, by the way. If you, haven't, if you haven't seen this and you have a young kid, highly recommend it. On the back end, it is connected into IBM's Watson service. All the magic of this, because this is a piece of plastic, but to a six-year-old child, this is their new best friend. You can talk to this thing. It will tell you jokes. It will tell you stories, take you on imaginary adventures. It's fabulous. All of that magic is happening in the cloud. It's ultimately a pretty dumb little endpoint. Now, when 5G comes in 2020, we're going to see more devices like this. I don't mean, I don't mean to be you know, mean by saying this is a dumb endpoint. This is a really smart business strategy to make this so simple. But with 5G, with the reduced latency and increased speeds that you get, most importantly, the reduced latency, the cloud essentially moves closer to the edge. And what that means is if you are trying to reduce costs in your endpoint, you're much more likely to leverage computing in the cloud. Because that latency is good enough that you can pretty much fake having intelligence inside devices. So 5G is going to actually put even more demands on you because you're going to have more people building dumber devices as a result of that reduced latency. You heard this morning about the Cambrian explosion of uh, server types. I would contend that we're going to see a Cambrian explosion of all these endpoints. Robots, connected toys, farming equipment, you name it. Endpoints that are smart and connected and creating massive amounts of data and consuming data services. If you add all of these up, actually multiply them all up, the workload growth that the data center community are facing is enormous. Because you have this endpoint Cambrian explosion of endpoints. You have richer data types that are flowing back and forth between the data center and these data types. You have the 5G, kick, 5, 5G kicker on top of that. Add into that, then, that a lot of these devices are going to want to access AI and machine learning and analytics services that require huge amounts of number crunching and potentially are going to leverage different types of underpinning hardware. So you have a big challenge, but it's an exciting one because you have helped enable the modern world as we know it today. You get to enable the next 10 years of change and growth and amazing experiences. So what does this look like in terms of what would I recommend for you? you know, I'm a futurist. I'm not here talking about 21-inch racks and heat sinks and stuff like that. There was a time I did that. Um, I, I have a little bit of cred on this. I co-wrote the original ATX motherboard spec back in 1996. That was me. So I know about motherboards and mounting holes and all of that. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a long time ago. So what do I recommend for you? First thing I'd recommend is, the first job I, I'd su suggest is help speed innovation in all of these industries. The world economy, which relies on innovation in all these industrial sectors, is standing on your shoulders. It's a big responsibility to have. And a lot of these companies, we hear about 3 billion new eyeballs coming to the internet. 
you're going to have many, many new businesses who are looking to data, who know they have to embrace these new kind of capabilities in their business that need to come and use your types of services. They don't have the budgets to do that with a huge IT department. So you need to find ways to help them adopt and scale with little or no IT. So that means packaged solutions. It means helping enable new business models to sell this stuff. And this may be not something that people in this room do, but your partners do. So packaged solutions. If you're a retailer, you don't want to buy a server. What you want to buy is a chatbot customer service solution. And maybe you can't afford, because retailers make like 4% margins or 2% margins if you're in grocery. They want new business models. So if they want a smart store, don't sell them a smart store. Sell them a smart store as a service where they can pay monthly. These solutions have to be totally bulletproofed. You know, you, we are now talking about every business in the world in the next decade becoming you know, mission critical with the data that they're using. So you've got to you know, keep working on reliability and fault tolerance and put security into devices as the default option, not something you can add into your design. If you want to interact with a data center, make it secure by default. And finally, these businesses don't know any better than I do what the future really holds because it is unpredictable. It's always unpredictable. But help them respond to things. Help them be flexible. I think you're already on the right path with all the conversation I've heard this morning about standard, 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 standard building blocks. But also, you know, how do we look to continue the, the path towards software-defined infrastructure to make it flexible so people can flex as their business needs require? So one more thought before I wrap up here is the way that computing is done is evolving. As Moore's law begins to slow a little, it makes more and more sense, and particularly as these workloads are becoming more and more focused on AI, machine learning, the types of computing that we need to underpin that is changing. You've seen Google come out with their TensorFlow processing unit. Um, Intel, the biggest acquisition Intel has ever made, focused on buying Altera's FPGA capability. And Intel also last year buying Nirvana's engine. Uh, Nirvana is a company focused on uh, neural processing units, similar to uh, IBM's True North stuff. So being able to embrace these new architectures, having the flexibility to bring them into the data center uh, is going to be key. And as Norman Joffe says, great software shines even brighter with great hardware underneath it. So final thoughts here for you. You have this unstoppable avalanche of data that is coming your way in the next decade. Moore's law is still, still going, but slowing, and eventually it will stop. And also the scaling of, you know, just throw some CPU cores at it doesn't always help. New architectures, new accelerators are going to be required, and many of these new workloads that I showed you early on in this talk, they will benefit from some sort of acceleration. So what we're looking towards is a much more heterogeneous data center where we start to think about the data center the way that chip designers have been thinking about SOCs for a while. What are the building blocks? What are the IP blocks? And how do I need to tune that for a particular workload or a particular company's data center? And that's going to require you know, standardized, easy to maintain hardware accelerator modules, programming models that make that possible so that it's easier to just bring those in as you need to. And then intelligent resource management to take a task and decide, does that need to happen over here or over there? But all of this balanced against continuing to focus on SDI as a way to maintain flexibility and scalability, as the businesses that are leveraging all of the stuff that you do respond to the things that change in their market. So as a futurist, as I look forward the next 10 years, it's going to be a very exciting decade, and the decade beyond that will be too. And the world is going to look to you for help to create these new services, these new products, and to interact with technology in completely new ways, and to interact with digital information services in completely new ways. You're on the right path. Keep up the good work, and I look forward to joining you in the future. Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day.